Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we meet together around your word, we pray that at the end of today, that we will make any mid-course correction, that we'll have our mind, the mind of Scripture, and that we'll be pleasing to you with a heart filled, ready to obey you. And so, Father, I pray this so you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, since we have such a wide gamut, before I actually begin our message today, I want you to know exactly to whom I'm mostly speaking, so that it'll have an impact upon your life. First of all, we could divide people into two groups. It's not going to be male and female. They're not going to be Hawaiians and mainlanders. It's going to be those that are absolutely certain of going to heaven when they die because they have been forgiven of all their sins when they place their faith alone in Jesus Christ. That would be a real definition of a Christian. So that would be a believer. That would be someone who's saved. That's a Christian. Those who have trusted Christ as Savior knowing they're going to heaven. The second group would be anyone that's on the journey beginning to, I don't even believe there's a God, all the way to the point where that they believe that going to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ, but they also must do some good deeds in order to get to heaven. They're just as far away as the other one that has begun their journey, not even believing there's a God. We would call that person on that journey, at least at this stage, a non-Christian, an unbeliever. Someone, and I know this might be a little stingy to you, and it doesn't mean to be, but, but lost. You're on your journey. You're trying to get to that place, but you're still lost. Well, today I want you to know that the majority of my message is specifically put together for those who are already knowing they're going to heaven when they die. So you're kind of already there. You're a blood-bought, born-again believer in Christ. And I want to teach you some things. Those of you that are on the journey, don't, uh, don't uh, stay on the outside. Listen to what you're going to hear because you're going to get some valuable information so you'll understand why Christianity is authentic and why it is safe to become a Christian and know that you can be a part of the community of the redeemed and you'll know exactly what you're getting into when you place your faith in Christ. Now, I believe in teaching the Bible verse by verse and God is so good in the way he designs this Bible is as we go verse by verse, there is information that is often capsulated around topics or truths. So as he goes verse by verse, we can grab a hold of something, a main point, a main theme that we can take with us. A couple of weeks ago, we began the theme of what kind of minister does a church need? Some of those on the outside, when they hear the word minister, they think of someone who is ordained, a reverend, a pastor, and it could be in any type of religion. But let's just say for those that know Christ as Savior. What kind of person would that be? What kind of minister does the church need? When we were together the last time, we discovered some important truths, such as that that minister needs to be, number one, needs to be chosen by God. Look at the verse, if you will, because it's coming from God's Word. So the minister that the church needs is someone that's chosen by God. It says, The gospel which you heard, which was preached, of which I, Paul, became minister for the sake of the church, I became a minister according to the stewardship or the responsibility from God, which was, here the phrase, given to me for you. So we learn, and this is important for you to understand, that a church needs a minister who has been selected by God to be a minister to start with and then brought to a point to be the minister of that local body. That's a person who's appointed. Now, I don't have time to unpack that message, I'd encourage you to get the CD because there's a lot of questions that were answered, such as, how do you know if you're called? Will you hear a voice? Is there some special way that you'll know? What do you need to do to be called of God? That's another time, but the point is still being this, that you need to be chosen by God. Now it would be good for me to broaden that point. You know, when you hear the word minister, again, you think of someone who's pastor of a church, and that's the minister. Technically, in Scripture, the word minister has a much broader understanding. First, it could mean a deacon. That's a minister. It could be someone who's a servant. That's a minister. And loosely, it would be a pastor. So now, it would be anyone who chooses to serve in a church. That person must be chosen of God. So we have two kinds of chosenness, if I can coin a word. One is the person chosen by God to be the 
senior minister or to be the pastor, to be the shepherd like Paul was. He was a pastor, a teacher, a preacher. All right? He was chosen by God, an apostle to do that. But in a general sense, God says, the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, you too were chosen to be not so much a, a, um, a senior pastor, and I use that very loosely again, but just as a servant of the Lord. Listen to a verse as I quote it to you. Just listen now. This is coming from the book of John, chapter 15, verse 16, and it's the actual words of Jesus himself. And he said it to a group of men who are being equipped to do ministry worldwide. And here's what he said to them. He said, you have not chosen me, although you might think that they would because they heard Christ, they chose to follow him. But really, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you to go forth and to bring fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So how do I make sense out of that? It's true that God will select certain people to do what we might call full-time Christian service, vocational service, we'll say. But then he says, every person who knows Christ as Savior has been selected by God to be a minister. So as I speak to this audience today, of those of you who know Christ as Savior, there could be some of you that already beating in your chest is a heart that says, I know that God has called me to go beyond my secular employment and perhaps even surrender to full-time vocational service. I might have to take some secular work to put food on the table like Paul did as a tent maker in the Bible days, but I know that I know that I know God's called me to ministry. So this message is for you, very specific. And then the rest of us here, that maybe you were not called to go into full-time vocational service, but you're a Christian. I want you to know that this message is equal for you as well because God has chosen you to minister. Change that. God has chosen you to serve. Now, who do you serve? Watch this. You serve the Lord, not to get saved, not to get into heaven, but because you are. Stay with me. And when you serve the Lord, he says, you serve me by serving others. And so right now, this message is for all of you who know Christ as Savior. And what kind of a servant does this church need from the pulpit to the pew as a Christian? What kind of a servant does this church need? We've already learned now that you had to be chosen, and you are. John 15, 16, and then the application from this passage. But let's go to number two. It's interesting how Paul gives this, this kind of shopping list of a job requirement for a minister. And he starts out by saying chosen, but he goes quickly and he says, a minister who joyfully endures suffering for the church. Now, I know that some of you, you might be on the outside saying this. I don't want to go into full-time vocational service if it means to suffer. I believe I shared this with some of you recently. That when I was in Bible college and seminary, they used to say that when you get into your church, what happens is you have the honeymoon stage, and then you have the work stage, and then you have the warfare stage. That sounded pretty accurate. A lot of guys, they had a great year when they began, and then after that, it was a lot of work, and then after that, there was nothing but problems in the church. But I will tell you that I don't buy into that. In fact, I think that's dangerous to tell new people wanting to go into ministry. Who would want to go into ministry to say it's fun when you begin, but it's nothing but heartache and warfare at the end of this thing? I don't believe it's like that at all. In fact, some people like to say, no, ministry is like you have great highs and great lows. I, that could be true too. But personally, I believe it's more like this. I believe God is so merciful and gracious to those that want to serve him that it's more like two rails on a track that in the course even of the same day that you will be blessed of the Lord and if you keep your eyes and ears open, you will experience the love kisses of God if you recognize his sovereignty moment by moment. And at the same time, there will be some suffering in your life. And I think that's often, sometimes very good. Because when we suffer, it brings us to our knees. It gives us the, the motivation then to go to the one who will comfort us, that draws us closer to the Lord. So the two rails of the track is we're blessings and sufferings at the same time. And so here's what he says. You need a minister who is experiencing the joy in the midst of suffering. Look at the passage. It's so beautiful there as it's written. Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What? For the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, if you will, stay looking at this verse, because I would like you to mark some things here, sir, so it comes off the page for you. He says here, he says, I now rejoice. All right, would you circle the word rejoice? 
Now, for some of you, you need to know, where is he now rejoicing? He is writing this material to a group of believers in a church in Colossae whom he has never met. He has never been to that city to the greatest study that I can find, but he still loved those people. But where was he? Was he in some little Mediterranean resort? No, he was actually in prison, and he was in prison because he was a minister of the gospel, and he was falsely accused and had a whole bunch of other stuff that was going on. And so, in a sense, he did not deserve to be in prison, but he was there. He was suffering. And the prisons of the Bible days are nothing like even the worst prisons of our days that we live in now. That being the case, he says, I now rejoice. Then circle the word in my sufferings, that phrase, my sufferings. He had a shepherd's heart because he didn't rejoice when some people in his church suffers. Now, there are some very fleshy pastors, even some ministers in the churches, servants in the church, that they almost like to know when someone else suffers because their attitude is if they suffer, that may mean that God can finally do something or they deserve to suffer. They're finally getting their due. Paul never had that attitude. His attitude was, I rejoice in my sufferings. He's not rejoicing when the Christians suffer, they go through afflictions, but he does rejoice in his own because he knows that when he's suffering, it actually can become better for the church as he can model the joy he has in suffering to help others go through suffering joyfully. And so he's modeling that in Christ. So he says, in my sufferings. Would you look at the word sufferings and underline the second S that's mentioned in there? It says, my sufferings. That would tell me, those of you that are in ministry, that there will be times of suffering and there'll be continual times of sufferings, plural, in your life. And you're going to experience that, but don't run from that because that's when you get so close to Jesus because no one knew more about suffering than he did. And it talks about my sufferings for you. Now, underline the words for you. He didn't suffer for himself. He says, whatever sufferings I'm going through, it's going to be to add value to your life. I'm suffering for you, for the church. Now, let's take this back for just a moment. Those of you who are preparing for ministry, remember the two rails? There's tremendous amount of blessing in this thing. You young people, I'd like you to lean into what I'm saying now. I know that you go to school and there's a plethora of careers in which you could go. And I know they're wonderful careers. You're in a room full of people that have careers that are not in full-time vocational service. But I would like to be maybe your only voice that's telling you that you ought to seriously consider going into full-time Christian ministry. You want to deal with accounting? As a pastor, you're going to be dealing with money and the disbursement of it accurately and fairly and balanced to be able to build God's kingdom. If you want to talk about law, you can also go into that as a pastor because you'll be doing a lot of mediation between what's right and wrong and people that are in conflict and issues even with the government. You'll need to know some of the law. You want to go into medicine? Sometimes I feel like I am a medical doctor for the amount of times I've been in the hospital visiting people and sitting there in their room and weeping when they, when they weep and having to tell them that they'll never walk again or why they have a lump. And so there is a bit of the medical, and I know it's a little different, but whatever that there is in the secular world, and I use that generally, the secular careers out there, all of that can be duplicated from business to professions right here. You need to know how to, some of you say, I don't want to go into that, I just want to be a plumber. Ask me how many times we've had to unstop a toilet, okay? How many times we had to figure out what we're doing with electrical or sweep up somewhere. Whatever career, male or female, whatever genre, whatever it might be, the pastor is there, and then you add to that. All of those are opportunities to connect with people with the gospel that maybe you couldn't connect in other ways because you now have the freedom. What a great joy that is. But there is still sufferings in this as well. And there's a tremendous amount. If you will look at the verse that's there found in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three and 28, Paul not only was talking about his sufferings there for the Colossian people in ministry, but he also had a whole life full of suffering. And here's what it says. Would you follow along? I'm going to read it to you, but get your pens ready because I want you to see how that this is a progression of suffering he had. He says, are they ministers of Christ, referring to others, I speak as a fool. I am more. Underline the phrase, I am more. I'm more of a minister. Then he goes on to talk about it. He says, in labors, more abundant. Would you circle the word labors there and put a number one by it? Because I want you to see the progression in ministry. Then he says, in stripes above measure. So it went from working very hard now to getting a little bit of persecution to the point that there was some physical pain. And then it says, in prisons more frequently. So circle the word prisons and put a number three there. So it went from laboring to being physically hit to now being incarcerated. Then it says, in deaths often. Now, he didn't die and come back to life and die and come back to life again. But what did happen in his life, 
He was at the very brink of death numerous times in his life. So he was right there at death's door for the ministry. You call, call that suffering. Now, you could read through the rest of the things that he endured, but I want you to get down to the very bottom of this. It says, And besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, underline that, is my deep concern for all the churches. Even in the midst of the sufferings that he had, he says, I still have concern for the church. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of that. Now, let me speak to those of you that are doing ministry here at church, not in a vocational way. There are going to be some suffering. Some of it may be because you're in ministry. Things that you started to launch, people now fight against it. Money you thought you had in your little line item on the budget is not there like you thought there would be. A time you came to be prepared to teach your class and your students didn't show up. Or a time that you had other staff people to work with you and they were late or they weren't prepared. There's going to be some of that suffering. I don't know where the suffering is going to come. But just remember that the sufferings is really a focal point for you to experience the fullness of joy from God when you give it all to him. I'd like to say a sad note on this. Um, Occasionally now that I'm old, you get invited back to your alma mater, to the schools and their constituency to come and speak. This this, This next September, they have invited me to come back to our reunion of our school, Florida Bible College, and wanted me to be one of the keynote speakers And I don't know how many people they've had through the years to come back to that. I've declined to go this year. I've done other times. Just we're just too busy to do that. But probably underneath the reason I'm not as comfortable coming back is because in past years when I would go back, these students that had such a hot-to-go-for-God attitude when we were students and were sacrificing so much to go into ministry, you now look at them and they're not in ministry. Some of them... I'm not talking about full-time, but just doing ministry. Some of them are not even serving as lay people in a local church. Oh, they attend, and you begin to talk to them, and you hear such things as the pride, like there's no church that teaches the way I think it ought to be taught, so I really don't want to engage in anything. And then you got the others that they're so immature, they say, I've been hurt in all these other churches when I was a pastor or a Christian leader, and I, I don't want to get hurt again, and people hurt me, and I don't want to get hurt, so they don't. And there's so many of those people that are dropping out. And I would love to tell you, please don't do it. God will bless faithfulness. He'll bless perseverance. He will bless long-suffering. He will bless endurance because there's real joy in that. Please don't give up. I'm not talking about the guys that had a church and now doing secular work and are now serving in their local church, hard at it, volunteering. I'm talking about those that basically have taken a back seat and they barely go to church and they tip God once in a while to ease their conscience. Folks, don't drop out. Drop in. Don't be a go-getter. Be a go-giver for God. And so if you're looking for a minister of a church, I want you to look for a minister whom you know, if he's in full-time vocational service, who himself has and is experiencing some degree of suffering, generally not brought on by sin in his life as a consequence, so God is trying to get his attention. But just what did he have to go through? You look at your ministers here in this church, What suffering they have gone through, a loss of a baby, challenges with health, issues when moving to the island. That's not badges of great things. It's just a badge of suffering, good. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Doing it joyfully is the badge. Let's go to number three. I think this is so important. Well, I I left out some blanks. I don't want to do that. If some of you are experiencing some loss of joy in your life right now, let me give you some areas that you might want to look at. And that would be living in his power. Some of you, it could be that you've lost your joy because you have gotten involved in ministry and you're doing it to the best of your humanly, human ability that you can. When we start doing things in the flesh, we forget that we can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and I would like to encourage you, To go back to find out, are you doing it in your strength that will eventually run out of gas, your strength that will focus on you, or will you do it in his strength that focuses totally on him? Secondly, living by faith. Paul never lost his deep confidence that God is in control of everything in his life that he can control. If you've got some joy robbers in your life right now, it could be that you're not living by faith, You're trying to manipulate and intimidate situations or people to get to your goal instead of God's goal, and you're failing, and you're involved in conflict. 
And when you are, it begins to steal your joy for ministry. And now you move from having a ministry in the church to a job in the church. Those of you that are in full-time ministry, you've lost your ministry calling. And now you're just doing it because you feel like you can't do something if you resign from the church. And so you just feel like you're locked into this thing through obligation. Because you've lost your faith in God. He is in control. And he's going to do mighty things. Don't give up. Don't quit. Number three. Living with your eyes on the Lord and remembering whom you are serving in ministry. Remember, while we are serving people, ultimately we are serving the Lord. And so it's all about Jesus and not about ourselves. So what do you look for in a minister? One who's been chosen by God specifically for ministry and those of you who have been chosen as a Christian now to serve in this faith family. Secondly, you look for someone who is joyfully enduring sufferings for Christ and for your growth. And then you as a minister in this church, sometimes there will be some pain you'll go through, but you still buck up and stay in the battle because that's where the joy is. Let's go to number three. The church needs a minister who makes the word of God fully known. Now, there are a lot of guys that can give you pop psychology. There are a lot of gals that can get up there and and, and draw you by their personalities. But God says our job is to communicate God's word. Let's look at verse 25 through 27. It says, Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you to do what? To fulfill the word of God. Some of you have a new American and some of you have a different translation. It actually means to fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That's what the word means, to fulfill the word of God. To fully carry out the preaching of the word. So he says, I was given the ministry to fully carry out the preaching of the word, which was what? The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't want to make this message too long, so I want to just focus on this mystery was not a mystery to God. It was hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament more evidently. And what is that mystery? And here's what you want to mark. The phrase at the end of the verse that says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, For a moment here, if you will, look up here, just for a second, if you don't mind. When you're looking for someone, no matter what ministry that they're involved in, no matter what task that it is, that task is still some way connected to people. Sometimes you never know when someone will come into your world to touch your world, and that purpose then is to touch that person for Christ. This past month, we had a gentleman that came to our parking lot. While he came into our parking lot, his car broke down because his, his, his radiator overheated. Pastor Charlie was down, and you know Pastor Charlie is bivocational. He doesn't get any money from the church. He works for secular work, and yet he comes here in the morning and he does all sorts of stuff. Dedicated staff, Pastor Dennis as well. But this time it happened to be Charlie, and Charlie was emptying all the waters because we have to take water out of the rooms every day. We, give out, we, we pour out 150 gallons of water to keep some of our belongings from um, getting mold on them. And so different staff members will do that. We all kind of take turns doing that. And so he was down here doing that. And he watched this poor bedazzled guy coming in here looking, what's going on? My car broke down. And so Charlie said, how can I help you? They began to talk about the problem. And then Charlie then invited him upstairs to make some phone calls, to offer him water and a cup of coffee and a little bit of a conversation. But Charlie knew it was far more than about a car that was broken down. It was a sovereign God bringing this guy here. Now remember, it is to help this guy with a broken down car, but it's not about making earth a better place for him to go to hell from. It's also about finding a way for him to get to heaven. Shortly, this individual began to talk about the Lord and find out if he's a Christian, find out where his journey is with God. Since then, this individual has come to men's meeting or singles meeting. He's been to church here. And he's asking, what can I do to help? He came to our work day just to do work around the building. He says, I'd like to do some painting and some custodial work here. We might even pay him a little bit. Last night when I was alone with him, I said, you know this? Listen, folks. I said, you may be custodial work here. We're still working through that little negotiation to find out where he's at. But here's what You may be doing custodial work, but believe me, when you work... Under our ministry here, it's not about bathrooms and sweeping and cleaning and helping Lincoln and painting. What it is about is doing that, but always with an antenna open to anybody who comes into your world, knowing that God permitted that person to cross your path so you can, here it is, fully proclaim God's word to that person. You are going to be the front line of the image of International Church right there in front of everybody. Do you know what that guy did? He just lit up. 
all of a sudden, it wasn't about cleaning commodes and sweeping and painting and doing electrical work. It was all, I'm, I'm doing this so the place is nice when people come, but it's also to be right there when someone from across the street at the school parks their car, someone's over at the bus coming into the bathroom or to get a drink of water, that I'm right there so I can touch them for God. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.